Okay, it is March 1st, time for a new program, and this time I'm doing uh, Close Encounters of the Bird Kind. And as it turns out, um, I had way too many birds to talk about. So this is part one of two parts. And um, please turn your videos off uh, if you have them on. Um, I don't know how to close it, so it's going to be recording a few people, so it's better if your video is off. Um, but I want to thank Paula, my dear, dear friend, uh, who is co-hosting again. And this is an out-of-focus picture of her, but that's okay, um, because it's also got Pip. She was one of the very first people to hold Pip as a puppy. And I'm dedicating this program to Ludwig, who was the very first bird I did okay with, and to Geppetto, the last bird I rehabbed before I let my uh, license uh, expire, and to Archimedes, who was not my rehab bird. He was an education bird. He came from the Back to the Wild Rehab Center in Castalia, Ohio. And I, he was perfectly healthy, but he was imprinted. And so he's become, uh, he became my bird and he lived with me from 2000 until he died in 2017. And he was one year old when I got him. So you do the math. He lived to be 18 years old. <coughs> I'm also dedicating it to Sneakers and Fred, who were a couple of my rehab failures, but I got licenses to keep both of them as education birds. And so we're doing Close Encounters of the Bird Kind, and this is part one in which I discovered how stupid people are, starting with me. I started out as a kid, and when I was about the age I am in this picture, just a little older, my big brother found a baby bird in our backyard, a baby robin, and decided to raise it. And so he put it in a shoebox, and I was supposed to feed it worms. This was not a picture of that bird. We were kids. This was like 1956, but um, or 1957. But we didn't know you had to put the food into the bird's mouth. We figured if he has worms right there and doesn't eat them, he must not be that hungry, right? And so it was disastrous how stupid we were. We figured when nobody was paying attention to him, the shoebox should be closed. So he was always in the dark and uh, that was not good. And the poor little guy, but um, I did not survive. I think he lived for maybe two days and it was heartbreaking. And so we had the, you know, requisite funeral for him. He was buried in a Band-Aid box and in the backyard. And I did not know it was possible to keep a baby bird alive. Well, then I started school. And when I was in first grade, I went to St. John Vianney Catholic School. And I managed to get actual copies of the textbooks that we used in reading class in elementary school. They were part of the Faith and Freedom reading series. And this is where I learned that if I joined brownies, I would learn how to take care of hurt birds. Because in this book, there was a, a story where uh, the little girls belonged to the brownies and they were supposed to uh, go on an adventure in the woods and their leader put signs in the woods. So they were supposed to look for different things when they found the signs or the little letters from her or notes. And one of the things they had to look at they found a squirrel, but they also found something next to the tree, a hurt robin. And its leg was broken and its wing was hurt. And so the girls took the bird back to the brownie meeting place and their leader made it all better. 
And so I thought that you could only become a brownie leader if you knew how to take care of birds. And so I wanted to join brownies so I could meet one of these cool people who knew how to help hurt birds. There's a close up picture. I did learn, ironically, when I became a brownie leader for my daughter's troop, I knew how to take care of hurt birds. So any girl, but I, nobody's reading the Faith and Freedom reading series anymore. So little girls are learning that they need to join brownies to learn how to take care of birds. I never used a splint like that. I used McDonald's straws plastic straws, I'd use a razor to slice it open and then could put it around the break and that held it in place really well without tape or anything. But uh, but the girls were very happy because when the bird got better, uh, they brought um, it back out to the woods and it could fly again and everybody was happy and the bird started singing and a happy ending and it made me want to become a brownie. When I went to college and uh, fell in love with birds thanks to Bob Hinkle who happens to be here right now and he was uh, got me hooked on wanting to become a naturalist and learn much more about nature. I was an elementary uh, education major and I decided to go to graduate school because I did not feel like I knew enough about the world to be able to be a good teacher, even if it was first grade or second grade. Um, and so I went to graduate school at Michigan State and uh, the grounds people on one of the, um, the ball fields on campus found a pair of horned larks had nested right by the pitcher's mound. And so the groundskeeper brought the two baby uh, horned larks. They tried to, they moved the nest first, but the, the birds didn't understand it. So they brought them to me, uh, to Glenn Dutterar, who was our, um, uh, the county extension, the university extension guy. And he gave them to me and I had no idea how to take care of these baby birds. I was feeding them, trying to feed them worms and bugs, but I did, I, there's no way a girl taking classes in college uh, can possibly find enough bugs. And I had no idea I could go to a pet shop or to a bait store and get some mealworms to feed it. I just had no clue. So these uh, two poor, adorable little babies ended up dying and I felt horrible about it. And I was never, ever, ever going to take care of another baby bird. I was very, very uh, certain of that. And then I became a teacher and I was teaching at St. James School, and I'm showing the church, which is attached to the school, but the, those two uh, towers, um, birds sometimes got caught in them, and one time a brown creeper flew into some place on the building, probably one of the windows over the doors or the, the big um, uh, designed stained glass window, and the our janitor found it and brought it to Mrs. Erickson because at that point I was a bird watcher and a bird watcher should know how to take care of birds, right? I had no clue. But, and I still didn't know that it's easy to get bugs at, you know, a bait store or at a pet store. So we were, the kids and I were spending a lot of time searching out bugs, but this little guy was, uh, he had a sprained wing, but that was the only thing. And so uh, after just two days, he could fly. And we took a hike to a park right near our school and let him go. And he stayed right there for the kids to watch. He had been so charming in the class. Uh, when 
uh, he would like land at the bottom of someone's leg. And whether it was a little boy wearing trousers or a little girl wearing knee socks, because they had to wear skirts, uh, it would spiral up their legs. So it was just so adorable. Everybody was so in love with this bird. And when we let it go, it didn't seem in a big hurry to get away from us. It flew to this nearby tree. I just have my old Olympus 50 millimeter lens on my camera. And then he flew to the next tree and he stayed so close for so long, but he got further and further. This is the last picture I got of him. And the kids were so proud and happy and sad all at the same time. So for homework, they had to uh, write an essay about the word ambivalence. Uh, but my kids there, uh, one of them found the cedar waxwing uh, by some fruit trees. It was apparently drunk and it had, it had sprained its wing. Uh, fortunately, I didn't get any birds with broken wings, so they all healed pretty quickly. But this one was in our class for a few days. And um, this was something I practiced on. By now, I knew I could feed it fruit as well as insects. And so it ate really well. And the kids, it was so calm with us. And I didn't realize it at the time, but cedar waxwings are flocking birds and they want company. And if they can't find another waxwing, well, it's any port in a storm. And so we would keep the drapes closed so it wouldn't crash into a window, but we let it just fly loose in the room. And it would just alight on different kids or me. And so some of us got a few little stains on our clothing, but the kids thought that was kind of cool too. So they were so thrilled to have that bird. Well, I was also the school choir director. And one day over summer vacation, uh, one of the little girls called me and said that she had found a baby robin and she had put it in a shoebox with some worms and it didn't seem hungry, but she had it for uh, since the day before. So this was the second day and it was at the end of the day, but she was going to be riding, um, going to school the next day for some sort of, I have no idea what, but so I rode my bicycle to school and rode home with this robin, only it was uh, at the stage where that robin was in the little cup picture that I showed you way earlier, it was just tiny. It's, it was crippled. Uh, neither of its legs could straighten up. Both the, t uh, the feet, the claws were just totally tightened and it had some sort of rickets. And we'd had a bumper crop of mulberries. And um, now I knew some people I could talk to to see if anybody had an idea. And they thought that it must not have gotten enough calcium in its diet. The parents must have just been taking a shortcut and getting food from the mulberry bushes instead of a more rounded diet. And so I had to give it a whole lot of bird vitamin D. Um, uh, this was in Madison, Wisconsin, and one of my friends told me all the steps for making sure it had a balanced diet. And you can't really see it, but this foot never did totally straighten out. But, uh, and the poor little thing could fly before it could hop. Its legs just stayed gnarled up for a long time, uh, but its wings developed properly. And little by little, the legs did. And the one foot got, uh, this toe is just a tiny bit crooked, but the other toes were, were badly crooked. But, oh, and that's where I first used little flat splints like snowshoes. And there I put, had to put tape to hold the bird's feet so they would stay flat on it. And um, it was, I was so scared that that little bird would die, 
but it just kept getting better and better. And it ended up being released in my backyard. Uh, it would come in at night and be finding food of its own, but come to me for food. Uh, I was home all the time because it was summer vacation and it started staying out at night and still wanting food in the morning. And then it stopped wanting food from me. I sort of hacked it out. Robins get pretty wild pretty suddenly when they can manage on their own. So I never saw that bird again, but he was doing pretty well. Well, I belong to Madison Audubon and my dear friend, Ken Wood, um, he and I w did a lot of birding together and he took me one day to uh, go canoeing. I forget, we were doing some sort of a, a bird count and uh, canoeing for it. And then we got back to the park where we'd put the canoes in. And when we were lugging the canoe back to his car, we saw the funniest thing, a little baby blue jay at the, uh, there was a playground and it was on the bottom of a slide and it would flap to go up the slide and it would get like three or four feet up and it, then it would just start sliding down where it couldn't control itself and it would kind of turn around so it could glide down or it would just go down backward but it just kept doing that over and over and over and it was the the funniest thing we'd ever seen and uh we went over and i picked it up because by then i knew you could touch baby birds they don't identify their babies by scent and I picked it up and Ken took some pictures of me with it. And I, he had a camera and I took some pictures of him with it, but he had the camera. So I've never seen those pictures. And then we let it go. Well, he brought me home and I started thinking, why didn't the parent Blue Jays come when we were holding the baby? That didn't make sense. The parents should have been, you know, very alarmed by two people around their baby. So I went back to the park and the first thing I saw was a golden retriever with a baby blue jay in its mouth. And I walked up to the dog <laughs> and said, give that to me. And he did, it must've been a really good hunting dog with a very soft mouth. There were a couple of spots of blood on the blue jay, but no kind of serious injuries. And that little bird was Ludwig. Um, I named him Ludwig and um, while I was getting him out of the dog's mouth, I saw two different blue jays fly into a great big tree with food and then fly out again. And that had to be his nest, but they totally ignored him. And they ignored the dog holding him. And I suddenly realized he did not make a peep. He didn't make a single sound during that whole thing. And I wondered if there was something uh, deficient about him. And I thought maybe he can't hear. And that's why I named him Ludwig after Beethoven. Um, and I just assumed that he couldn't hear. He did start making fairly normal vocalizations uh, after I'd had him for maybe 10 days, but he was silent uh, for the longest time. But I called my friend, Malcolm McDonald, who had come to Madison. He worked for the, um, the big uh, laboratory that does a lot of forensic work on uh, what kills wildlife. Um, I can't remember what the name of it was, but he had lived in the West for a long time and had gotten a pet magpie back when they had bounties on them and absolutely no legal protections for them. And he had had that magpie for its whole life. Uh, he'd had it for over 20 years. And so I knew he would know what I should do to take care of this baby blue jay. And so he gave me all kinds of instructions about the food and not putting it in a cage so its tail feathers wouldn't get frayed or its wing feathers and um, 
just taught me all kinds of things about how to take care of a baby blue jay. So I learned so many things for him. When I got him, it was like uh, the last week or the second to the last week of school. And when school was out, I brought all the stuff from my desk home to our apartment. And when I was taking it out, I had this orange bell from a pit game. And I used that on my desk. This is the actual bell. And I, in class, I would just ring the bell when I wanted the kids to be quiet because I didn't like yelling or talking loud. And it worked great. And so Ludwig looked at it because it was this big orange thing. And I just pressed the button on top and he just, his crust goes up and he jumps back and he's so curious about it. And he goes straight up to it and presses that button with his beak. And it made a sound, but it didn't make that clear ding because his he was too little. His breast was against the actual bell. And um, so he looked back and it was cocking his head. It was really cute how he would cock his head different ways when he was trying to figure something out. And so I rang it again and he lurches back and then he creeps up and he tries again and, and he just kept being scared because he couldn't do it or frustrated. And um, I think that was the night that MASH and the Mary Tyler Moore show and All in the Family were all on TV. So Russ and I uh, went to the bedroom where the TV was and um, left Ludwig to his own devices. And all of a sudden, maybe 20 minutes later, I hear this thing. And then I hear, ding. And then I hear, ding, 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 ding. And I came running and he was hovering over the bell. So he wouldn't be, his breast wouldn't be touching the clapper while he was pressing the button. It was the coolest thing, how he had to figure that out. But he taught me all kinds of things. He would catch, uh, we played Frisbee with a little uh, toy helicopter thing that came with some um, uh, Rice Krispies or something. And it was a little helicopter thing that would, you turned it around and it was rubber band powered. And when you let it go, it flew up in, in the room and he would chase it, catch it in midair and bring it to me and we would, play that. And then we started playing that in the backyard when I was trying to start teaching him to live outdoors and be a wild bird. He would find things and pick them up. And one to, and if he caught a fly against the window, we, we didn't have any fly problems that, that spring and early summer because he nailed every fly in a window and ate it. But the first time he caught an ant, he picked it up and all of a sudden, it's like he, he got a taste of it, spit it out, his crust went up and he just looked furious. He just looked so upset. And then he, all of a sudden he stops, cocks his head looking at the ant, grabs it with the tip of his beak and starts rubbing it on his feathers. And that was the first I ever found out about anting. Uh, ants' bodies are laced with formic acid. That's why they belong to the family Formicidae. It's for formic acid. But they, um, that's their protection. And it's very bitter. But some birds take advantage of it. Getting that formic acid on their feathers probably helps keep lice and mites under control. And it was apparently an innate behavior that the taste of that ant when he first picked it up is what told him to do that. And I found out about sunning from this bird because when we were playing Frisbee out in the backyard, um, the Frisbee landed on the roof of our apartment, which was a two-story apartment. We were in the basement and then there were two other floors. And he flew up to get it on the roof. And the moment he touched the hot roof, he keeled over on his side, opened his one wing, his crest went up, but his head was on the side and his eyes were closed and his mouth was open. And he looked like he had had a heart attack right there. 
and he just did not move. And so I charged into the, the building. The other half of the basement that was in our apartment was everybody's storage units and some maintenance stuff. And the landlord had a ladder in there. So I'm afraid of heights, but when it's a baby bird, you got to do what you got to do. I climbed up the ladder, got on the roof, walked up to him. And the, as I'm just about to pick him up, he like shakes his head. It's like he was in a trance and he shakes his head, comes to, grabs the Frisbee, the little helicopter thing, and flies back down. He was fine. And that's and every time one of these weird things happened, I would call Malcolm McDonald and he would tell me what it was all about. Uh, when he first took baths in our kitchen sink, he would get sopping wet. And then he couldn't fly, but he didn't know that the first couple of times he'd be drenched and he would flap his wings and jump off the sink and crash onto the floor because his feathers were too heavy and wet. Um, he got caught in the rain when we were doing, when he was spending more and more time outdoors, a big storm was coming and I would go out in the backyard and try and call him, but he didn't come in. And then the storm started. And when I went out after the storm, I got on my bicycle and started riding around the neighborhood looking for him. Um, and he was sitting on a phone wire and that has to be where he was for the whole storm. He was sopping wet. You could not tell this was a blue jay. His feathers were so dark brown, just drenched. And he didn't have any shape to him. And when I called him and saw him up there, he just went, ma, ma. And so I pulled my bike over and told him to come down. Well, it just happened to be right over a busy bus stop with a round. 10 people standing there watching this crazy woman calling at a blue jay going ma ma and then he he flew down and he crashed because he couldn't fly but he landed in the grass so everything was cool um but i did not have a permit to keep him and he uh, so I had to let him become wild and I hacked him out. He lived in the backyard when he wanted to come in the apartment. He would look in the windows and peck at him until he caught our attention and we go and let him in. And uh, he was spending more and more time outside. A family of Blue Jays, the parents at first were trying to chase him away. And every time they'd start chasing him, he would just go. Uh, if I was out there, he'd get, he'd land on my head, face him, and say, ha, 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 my mom's bigger than yours because they wouldn't come near when I was there. Um, but the next spring, when we were in Chicago over spring break, our neighbor was out sunning in her backyard, and she saw Blue Jay go to all the windows of our apartment and peck on him. And then he landed on her chair. Uh, on the arm of her chair and was looking up at her very intently, but he wouldn't let her touch him. And so we figured that had to be Ludwig. I have no idea why I always refer to him as Ludwig, ex uh, as a he, except that I named him after Beethoven. There was no way I could possibly know what sex he or she was. Um, but little by little, I was learning how to take care of birds. But if, when I stopped being a teacher, became a mother, I didn't get birds anymore because those usually came from kids. Um, so I had a nice big break from taking care of hurt birds uh, for several years while my kids were babies. And um, I know how cosmically ignorant I was. Um, and I still feel so sad about that baby Robin when I was four, year, four or five years old and about those horned larks. Uh, my ignorance was extremely profound. Not too bad when you're four years old, but when you're in college, you should know how to find resources to teach you. And I didn't yet know about what to do. Um, 
but we all have to start somewhere. And I wrote a book back in 2006, 101 Ways to Help Birds, and it's on my website now, so you can read the, the entire book for free online, um, chapter by chapter. But it was such a bummer researching my book because of all the bad things that happened to birds and just finding out more and more about it. But after my time as a rehabber, which was during the 80s, uh, the late 80s and the 90s up to about 2000, um, I'd already seen how abysmally ignorant we human beings are. And so uh, that was what gave me a lot of the basis of what things people need to know about. Um, some of it is ignorance, but some of it is just that people are mean. Um, the, uh, right after I started doing my radio show for the birds in 1986, we did not have a rehab facility in Duluth. There was one woman who had been taking care of birds for years, Connie Sunquist, who was amazing. But most people didn't know about her. And when they found hurt birds, all of a sudden, they figured, well, that lady who talks about birds on the radio must know. And I would start coming home from, you know, uh, dropping a child off at kindergarten or something, and there'd be a box on the porch with a bird and a, and a note saying, take care of this bird, God bless you, or something. Um, this one came to me from a radio listener. It was in 1986, it must have been the first year of the program. Uh, somebody had, uh, this is not, that crow, I do not, I, I did not take a picture of Icarus and I so regret it. And it was before videotapes too, so I didn't take any movies because he did some really cute things. But he was a young crow in the fall. So he had been raised by his parents who had taught him, don't trust people. If you raise a baby crow in the nest, from the nest, they are so tame, but it's like they went to that D.A.R.E. program in school where the policeman tells them all the horrible, horrible things about any kind of drugs. So all of a sudden, your fifth graders coming home and telling you to throw out the aspirin from the medicine cabinet because it's a drug. That's how baby crows generalize staying away from people. People are evil. They, they listen to their parents, indoctrinate them. And Icarus hated my guts. No matter what I did, and, and he got better. His, he, um, my, my vet took a, um, an x-ray and he had, he uh, shot all over. But in his wing, uh, one wing was completely broken and we set it and, um, it, it healed enough that it didn't drag, but he could never open it to fly. Uh, so yeah, I got a permit to keep him as an education bird. Uh, but he hated me and my husband. I did learn that if I needed to trim his claws, because he was in a house and they didn't get naturally trimmed, all I had to do was when he was sleeping at night, go down with a flashlight and keep it mainly hidden, uh, the light pretty dark, and then we could just shine it on his feet so I could trim him. And he was like immobilized because it was night. Um, but the one person he liked in the house was Tommy, my little boy, who was uh, one year old, one and a half, almost two, or he must have been just two. And it must have been Joey's birthday. And uh, we were eating birthday cake. And all of a sudden, Tommy takes a big chunk of birthday cake and walks up to Icarus, who had a perch in the dining room, and held it right up to him. And Icarus just so tenderly took it out of that little boy's hand when he would have, if I had tried that, he would have bit me hard with his very sharp beak. But 
he was so gentle with Tommy. And after that, they were best friends. And we had this really lightweight big ball and Tommy would roll it and Icarus would hop over and hit it with his beak straight back to Tommy and they could go back and forth for 45 minutes, a little, you know, two year old and a, and a crow. But tragically, uh, I saw Icarus grab a, a yellow jacket when he was, when we'd had him for two years and he grabbed it whole and it must have stung him in his throat and killed him. And so that was tragic, but um, I learned a lot about crows and I, but I was heartbroken that he died. Um, people are, are horrible though, to just shoot a bird like that and um, for fun. Uh, uh, this, uh, not this Pied Bill Grebe, but I got a phone call, maybe 1998 or 99. Uh, two little boys uh, would go around at Lester Park Golf Course and retrieve balls for golfers and try to see if anybody would hire them for caddying. And they'd heard a funny sound in a garbage can and looked in, and there was a Pied Bill Grebe in the garbage can. And it had some monofilament around it, which does not belong in a golf course, but it must have started flying up from the lake because uh, the golf course isn't that far from Lake Superior. And it must have uh, just something couldn't keep it up and it landed on the golf course. And some golfers who um, didn't have the, um, like courage to break its neck, just threw it live in the garbage can. So these little boys called me and I came and um, they were the ones who, I took them over to Lake Superior. We untangled it from all the monofilament and um, it just had a couple of bruises on its feet, but it was fine. And so we, uh, it must have just been struggling on the golf course and people got irritated with it. So these uh, little kids helped me release it and they were so proud that they saved its life. Um, monofilament is evil. It just sits there like time bombs. Um, the, I do not have a picture, thank goodness, of one of the most traumatizing things when I was a rehabber. People brought me a common loon that had been entangled and it went around its beak. And so the poor bird had been unable to eat for a long time. The tissue at the base of its bill was all necrotic. It was uh, swollen, it had been infected and then became necrotic. It ended up dying, it went down straight. Um, it was only at my house for like 10 minutes before um, uh, we had a ride already to get it down to the Raptor Center, but they couldn't, it was too far gone. But it, monofilament just lays out there like a time bomb. Um, some people called me in 2005 or six because there was this weird flicker in their yard, this woodpecker, they didn't know what kind it was. It was what, sitting, part of the time it was sitting normal in the tree and then it would just suddenly flop. And when I got there, it was tangled. It had monofilament. Now they fish, but they have all their fishing stuff at a different at their place on the lake. So there was no monofilament that they knew of in their yard, but this bird must have had it somewhere. And do you see how it's tangled in the tree on the bark so that it couldn't get off it just had a very narrow area that it could move on that tree. And um, even when it could straighten up temporarily, it was stuck. So I fortunately, well, I had to run and buy a pair of scissors and clip it to release the poor thing. Uh, but it hadn't lost very much weight considering it had been there for two days. Um, it must have really put on a lot of weight right before this and it flew into a nearby tree and 
did not want to be deal with humans anymore, and that was fine with me. But because I got into all the line off it. Uh, I got this picture at Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge in 2016 that Anhinga cannot eat, but it was too healthy so far to let a person catch it to uh, get that monofilament off. But it's evil. I was birding on my big year. Um, I was on one of Kim Eckert's trips in Colorado and this redhead was flying, was swimming really weird. And all of a sudden we realized it's because it was tied to monofilament line that was stuck on something in the water. It did manage to escape. Um, so that was good. But a lot of times they need help. I was with uh, Eric Bowman and Larry Ford out in California in Santa Cruz, and we came upon wads of monofilament on the fishing pier, which made me exceptionally angry because right there, they had a monofilament receptacle for fishermen to use. So there was no excuse for that. And uh, that was in September. And in November, I was at Anzal Duas County Park in Texas, where uh, Donald Trump once did one of his things about how bad all the evil Mexicans are. When I was there, it's a park. And on the other side of the river, there were Mexicans, because the river is the Rio Grande, having picnics. And we're all waving to each other. And it was pretty friendly. It's a really nice park. But there was a hook-billed kite. And I was watching it. Then it flew to a, a tree not too far. I could get to a good place to get a good angle. And I started running and tripped on this and I was more worried about my camera than my legs but my I had a really bad bruise for a while from this evil stuff and then just in 2018 I took this picture in uh, Ashland Wisconsin it's so frustrating how it how pervasive it is well I can't blame people for getting identifications wrong because every birder gets things wrong. But a guy called me up one night and told me that he had a baby barn owl in his barn um, around uh, not too far from Cloquet. And so I, uh, and he asked if I would take it. So I said, sure, I was going to go down to the Raptor Center, but the thought of a barn owl up here was pretty thrilling. This is what barn owls are supposed to look like. And I'd asked him on the phone because it's so improbable to have a barn owl in St. Louis County. I said, he has big dark eyes, right? And he said, yeah. And it's got kind of funny, fuzzy feathers and a, a curved beak. And he was sure. So he brought it over and it was a baby pigeon. <laughs> So I ended up with Bernice, um, who became my son Joey's pet and um, was, uh, turned out to be a male, not a female. But we named him Bernice for um, Bert's pigeon on Sesame Street. So um, that was the story of Bernice. Uh, there's a lot of problems when people rescue birds. Some little kids up in uh, Grand Marais rescued a little sawhead owl uh, that had fallen out of its nest. And so it was very malnourished when I got it. Um, uh, the DNR confiscated it from them and brought it to me. And then it just was with me for a few days before it went to the Raptor Center. Um, but little kids are like when I was a little kid, and my brother, we didn't know. And, you know, it's good for them to learn. But, um, and so their parents really should have brought it somewhere right away. But that's not as big a deal as what happened. My daughter is on her swing holding a baby red eyed vireo. There was a storm that knocked a red eyed vireo nest out of a tree not too far from Duluth. And the woman decided to raise the four babies herself 
so her children could see the miracle of baby birds. And she didn't know what to feed them, but she figured dog food was probably good. And dog food is an ingredient that I used a lot in my baby bird mixes, but she was just feeding them dog food, a canned dog food and putting it in their mouths, but not knowing to keep the little birds clean. When she brought them to me uh, right before the 4th of July weekend, she said she wanted her children to see it, but she knew they were gonna die and she didn't want her children to have to see that. And they were gonna have company that weekend. So she brought them for my children to get to watch. You couldn't tell what kind of birds they were at first because their whole bodies were caked with a horrible amount of dried dog food. It had been wet and it had dried and caked and it was encasing their heads, their wings, their little brains, their heads were, were abnormally small because they couldn't grow with this thick, hard mass around them. And, oh, it took, I was bathing them for three hours the day I got them, just, you know, getting everything off, trying to keep them warm. It was a nightmare. And there were four of them and one by one they died and it was heartbreaking. That was the healthiest of the four, but they were all, uh, it was just such a sad, sad thing. And it um, made me very angry because she didn't want her children to see them die. And we had little graves and my daughter is the, um, uh, wrote a really sad poem about them. It was heartbreaking. Um, a little boy brought me a baby, I don't have a picture of it, spotted sandpiper. And um, he knew he had to rescue it because it was running around and there was a cat there. And that was a good reason to pick it up. Um, he didn't know that the best thing would be, uh, you know, to shoo the cat away or um, something and then um, get the bird back with its parents. But he knew exactly where he found it. And so two days later, he brought me right to the spot where he'd found it. And we didn't have to look hard before we found the mother and another chick or father and another chick, probably the father because shorebirds, the dads do more work and um, let it go. And it just shot over to its parents. So that was a happy ending. And when I was teaching an elder hostel, this guy was driving down a road um, by Burnside Lake up uh, near Ely. And um, a mother snipe was crossing the road with her babies. And this baby stayed on the wrong side of the road. And he didn't know what to do. And another car came and this guy got, the mother just kept charging uh, away with the baby she still had. So he brought this one to our camp and he showed us right. So 10 minutes later, we went right back to the spot and it didn't take too much work to uh, find the mother. So it had a happy ending. Cats belong indoors. And that people can't figure that out is so frustrating. Uh, one of the, uh, I had one poor morning dove that had been mangled by a cat and um, it died minutes after coming to my house. Uh, the birds, uh, cat, whether they're using their claws or their teeth, they're so sharp that they leave puncture wounds. And the, uh, so even if the bird doesn't seem very injured, they die several days later from massive infections. That was what happened to uh, one chickadee I had, happened to so many robins, baby robins especially. Uh, the one woodcock I had uh, back, I think in 98, um, was mangled by a cat. And the saddest one for me was an evening grosbeak. I always treated them with amoxicillin when they first came in. And I had a female evening grosbeak who uh, her wings 
had uh, both been badly damaged. So I had to um, bandage her and I had a belt bandage uh, using that wrap, which doesn't stick to them around her body. And then the wings held to that. They didn't seem um, broken, but also I was giving her amoxicillin to prevent infections. And um, I, every few days you have to take off the wing bandages and, you know, and uh, give the wings some physical therapy or they start getting all these yucky calcifications and get immobilized. And finally it was time to take everything off. And I took off the bandage around her middle. She opens her wings and fell over dead. And what had happened was she had broken um, uh, some of her ribs on her back. Uh, and uh, their back is where you can actually feel ribs and their lungs are right underneath it. And when she stretched, it must have punctured her lung. And it was just heartbreaking because I'd gotten very attached to that bird. Um, it's so frustrating. And it was one woman brought me like 10 different birds that her cat had gotten. And she would always go away feeling so virtuous that she had saved its life, but she didn't. Um, this is my cat, Casey. She was a feral cat who lived on birds. And now she's, a, you know, she became an indoor cat. She just died a few months ago, but she, was the best indoor cat uh, because that's where they belong. Um, a, a, a woman I know brought me uh, this nut hat. She said her cat had gotten it. She'd saved it from her cat and it was it seemed fine except it was so lethargic, but she couldn't see any injuries. Well, I didn't take a picture of the other end, but it had ripped out the cat's tail along with the pygostyle, the bone that the feathers are anchored to, the tail feathers, it had ripped it out and it was totally open in back. And it died like five minutes after she brought it to my house. Um, but not all cat injuries had happy endings. So I'm gonna tell you my happy ending cat story. This little pine siskin, somebody brought me in, um, it was uh, early spring. I didn't think birds had babies that early, um, but it was a pine siskin. Uh, it turns out that the true finches, the siskins and crossbills, um, and um, uh, sometimes have, can nest in winter when there's a good crop of food. Uh, for them to feed their young because they don't feed their young insects. They feed them regurgitated seeds. So, and the babies are way more adorable than most nests, uh, young nestlings because they start out with a lot of um, downy feathers to keep them warm when uh, though the parents take turns on the nest. So they're not left unattended, but that helps keep them warm. Anyway, it was the most adorable, tiny baby bird, but it had cat wounds on its body. So I, and I didn't, I called Marge Gibson down in Antigo, asking her how much amoxicillin to give it. And she said, just give it a drop whenever you think about it. It was the same pink medicine we gave our kids when they had ear infections. But um, uh, when I'd had it two days, when I went in in the morning, its wings looked weird. And I looked and it had these air sacs that were protruding through the puncture wounds under its wing. And they were like these two little tiny balloons holding its wings a little bit up. Well, by the next day, they were bigger and they were like pulsating and they were really thin and I didn't know what to do. I was so afraid if something punctured it, whoosh, the bird would, you know, be blown off course or something horrible. But um, I didn't know 
what to do. And I would not let my kids see it because I knew this little tiny adorable bird was going to die. I just knew it. But it looked at me with these bright little sparkly eyes and would beg for food. So I, I figured, well, it's not going to die hungry. Um, and I just kept taking care of it. And uh, oh, those things, the, the wings started just looking so weird. Um, and it, this went on for, you know, uh, seven or eight days. And then one morning when I went in, the wings seemed just a little lower. And I thought, well, that's my imagination because I wanted those air sacs to shrink. But by the next day, I could tell it for sure. And a couple of days later, the wounds had totally closed up and the air sacs were not sticking out anymore. And um, so that's when the little bird started staying in Katie's bedroom. Uh, we had a cage for it that it, we just kept the whole front of the cage open so it could go in or out, but that's where it slept. And um, she just loved that little bird. And she would go on her swing set and the way she was with that red-eyed vireo, uh, the bird would sit on her finger. And when she would swing forward, it would flutter its wings. And when she went backward, it would keep the wings closed and then flutter and then close. And it started flying around. We had a lot of pine siskins at the bird feeder and it would hang out with them, but then it would go back to Katie. She would ride her tricycle with her one little finger sticking up, you know, when the, her hands holding on the steering, the handlebars, and it would be sitting on her one little finger. And um, day by day, it started spending more time with the birds and less time with Katie. And one day it didn't come in at night. And we were all really sad because we figured it's probably not going to come in anymore. In the morning when Russ opened the back door to let the dog out, in flew the pine siskin, went through the kitchen, through the dining room, around and up the stairs, in, straight into Katie's room, got in its cage and started swinging maniacally like something had happened overnight that just had to work off that horrible energy or something. I have no idea when it happened. But, it, and it would not leave Katie's room all day and all night. The next night but then the next day it went out and it never came into the house again and it would still come down to katie occasionally and then it just disappeared but the next spring when we finally had nice enough days that katie could take her tricycle outside she was riding on the front sidewalk and down flew a little pine siskin right onto her finger and it was so lovely so that's my one cat success story. Now, I expect people to know what they're doing about birds, but I'm not really the right one to talk. Um, a few, uh, wow, it's probably been 15 years now. I was leading a field trip during, we had a really cold spring. Yeah, it was 2004. We were having a terribly cold spring. And um, my, I had, scarlet tanagers and all kinds of birds coming to my bird feeders and Baltimore Orioles and Cape May warblers were just gobbling up as much jelly as they could. And so I was going to lead a field trip in the morning. So I put out a bowl and usually I just put little plops of jelly and kept refilling it. But I filled the bowl two thirds of the way full. So the birds would have enough to eat while I was gone. And I came home and it looked like there was a little crocodile in the jelly. All I could see were two eyes and the little tip of the bill. And that's all I could see. And I fished it out and it was this poor red-breasted nuthatch. And, oh, it looked horrible. And this is after I gave it a few baths. Uh, this is after a few more baths. And fortunately, it was one who knew me. So the whole time I was bathing it, and I had it for about three hours, it was eating uh, mealworms out of my hand. So that was good. And it looked better than this when I released it, but it didn't look all that good yet. Um, there's a, a difficult point 
that you have to decide whether to release it uh, because they it's the preen um, and the sunshine's really important for helping them dry, but also the preening, they do it more when they're outside. And so I finally let it go and it didn't come back to my feeder all that day. And it didn't come back the next morning. And I was so worried that it hadn't made it, but it did come back the next afternoon. And this is it. And you could just see a little hint of jelly on, um, where is it? Right here. And there was a little bit more on the other flank, but that's the same bird. So Jelly Belly survived. And those are my stories for tonight. Uh, next time, it'll be part two in which I discover how smart birds are compared to us people. And so I hope I didn't put you to sleep and stay safe and well, and I'll stick around and we can open it up so we can do questions. So I have to figure out where these questions are. Oh, somebody's here who I helped them. Uh, so, oh, Sarah and Britta, because I helped them um, identify a long-eared owl last fall and a pheasant wandered into their yard. And Penny's here from Loveland, Colorado. And some people are still getting evening gross beaks at their feeders. We haven't had any here. Um, and uh, Oh, and Karen must, or Karen must have my book um, and cats belong indoors. And yeah, if they're uh, uh, tied up and some people have special enclosures that the cats can't get out. Um, and uh, thanks for coming to you, Noel. And um, so any questions? I have a question, Laura. Um, okay, Kath. What uh, did what did you have? Um, uh, what setup for your birds? I mean, you must have had cages and other things for them. Well, I learned early on that you can't keep birds in cages with metal bars if they're gonna be released uh -huh. because it frays their feathers. Mm -hmm. And I never had that many birds at a time. And um, my office was a little crawl space closet we had upstairs. And um, that's where I kept most of the birds. Um, when uh, I'll talk about nighthawks next time and um, we had one I had as an education bird, Fred, and he would sort of take other nighthawks that I was caring for, um, show them the ropes and stuff. So they all stayed together in little clumps. But when um, our, our house was like the happening house in the neighborhood where kids would come to play Legos and stuff. And it was so cute how when anybody would come in, uh, they just, you know, it was a house you could just walk into, but they'd say, where's Fred? Because they didn't want to accidentally step on him and they had to make sure the coast <laughs> was clear. It was so adorable. He was named for Mr. Rogers. Mm -hmm. And I have a lovely letter from Mr. Rogers because... Um, but uh, so yeah, I didn't have cages. And uh, until we got Archimedes, uh, Russ made me a big flight cage using wooden dowels. Um, and then my home office was the biggest room in the house instead of a small closet. Um, and a lot of the birds just flew around when I raised the baby blue jays uh, that, that uh, I accidentally left. Uh, when they learned to fly, they would be loose in the house or out in the yard except at nighttime. And then um, usually I just put them in a room where there was newspaper under everything they would be likely to perch on and hope for the best and buy a lot of Lysol. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the worst, what's the worst injury you got from these birds? I almost died uh, when I was brought four sick sanderlings 
that had been poisoned. We had uh, a really bad series of storms one fall and uh, the storm sewers uh, overspilled into the lake, including a whole lot of medical waste. So I had these four sick sanderlings. I didn't usually get sick birds. I got injured birds. But these poor things, um, uh, three of them recovered, but one died. But the one that died, when I was holding it, a louse jumped from the bird onto me. And every now and then, you know, birds usually have lice or mites or, you know, at, at some small level. But this one was crawling with them. And I watched a louse bite me. And that never happens because the lice are, uh, you know, you can work out taxonomy of lice and of birds because they stay on one species. And so for it to bite something that wasn't even the right species tells you the, the louse was sick too. Well, I got so sick. I had a temperature, I forget how high it was, but I was hallucinating. I was laying on the sofa, my golden retriever walks up to me and I knew she was a wolf who had killed my dog. And I mean, but in a lucid moment, one of my nighthawks died too. And that nighthawk had an injured wing and I just gotten it and it was a, a compound fracture. So it was getting uh, amoxicillin and it was healthy and recovering, but it died. And so I knew whatever the organism or, you know, whatever it was that I had would not react to amoxicillin. They took blood titers and sent them down to the vet school and the Mayo Clinic. And they never, uh, they thought it could be like psittacosis or something, but they never isolated what it was. But um, I apparently have recovered. <laughs> I never got, you know, I, I it was funny. Um, I, I didn't get scratched or bitten very often. Uh, birds are, uh, uh, Robert Nero told me if you have an owl, you stroke it up here on its forehead and you put your head by its bill and that's like showing it that you're not gonna hurt it. And uh, it worked. It didn't work for hawks, but I wasn't crazy. So I didn't get footed. <laughs> It, it wouldn't work for for two two gulls at one time. Oh no, no! And uh, <laughs> one time I had to carry a, a great blue heron on a truck ride with Marge Gibson driving when we were going to release it. Uh, it was her bird, and um, they only weigh, you know, five or six pounds less than my grandson weighed when he was born, and but boy, they can pack a wallop. And so you have to hold the bill shut and in place and you have to, you know, immobilize the bird against your body. And it's tricky, but, but I have apparently lived to tell the stories. <laughs> now I've let my license expire. It would be almost impossible for a lady to go on the radio and talk about birds and people to give her birds and then she can get a license to take care of them. Uh, you have to be trained now, which is a really good thing. I was self-taught with calling Marge Gibson a whole lot and the Raptor Center and the wildlife clinic down in the Twin Cities. Uh, when there were difficult things. And I lucked into, um, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, I just had so many supportive people that I knew I could get help from. Uh, but even before I had my license, both the DNR and um, the guy, our uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service guy in Duluth, they were telling people to bring me birds. They were telling people for years to bring them to Connie Sunquist, and she never got a license. But now that you just couldn't get away with that. No more questions? 
Oh, somebody um, wanted me to share approaches to helping a bird that's been stunned by hitting a window. Uh, birds do not break their neck when they hit the window. The reason their neck is so floppy when they die from it is because their neck is so long inside their body. And when they aren't using their muscles to hold it erect, it flops. It's not like our neck. Um, it's much, much longer. Um, but and birds have uh, can have many, many more vertebrae in their necks than than we mere mammals. Whether you're a blue whale or a manatee or a giraffe, you have seven um, cervical vertebrae. But birds, it can vary crazily. But uh, when they hit the window, if they land upside down, uh, they're going to die if you don't help them. And the way you help them is you pick them up bring them to a bush. If they can hang on to the bush, leave them. About 50% of the birds that hit windows and, and, are, and live to tell the story end up dying. About 50% of the survivors die from uh, subcutaneous uh, hematomas and just yucky stuff in their brain. It's like uh, Natasha Richardson, the actress who was skiing and hit her head badly and didn't get medical help right away and died. Um, and medical help for humans is way more advanced than what you can do for a bird with a, you know, subdural hematoma. So, uh, but, so you want to see if it can perch. If it can perch, it's got a pretty good probability of making it. If it can't perch, then you put it in a box and you make some sort of thing to hold it upright. Uh, you can use a donut cushion. If it's a tiny, tiny bird, just use some tissues, form it into a nice sturdy little donut and put the bird in the donut and that'll hold it upright in a shoe box. If it's bigger, you might need a kitchen towel or a bath towel, depending on the size. You want it upright. And that's also how you transport a bird to a rehabber. Um, and then you, you, you keep the box closed. You make sure there's, uh, you know, uh, air circulation. You, uh, if it's the dead of winter, don't bring it into your house because that will feel too hot, but bring it into like your basement, not your main house. Uh, when you take it out to try and release it, never pick the box, uh, peek in, in the house, because if it is better and bursts out, then you're going to have a bird hitting your window on the inside instead of the outside. So take it out, open it and see if it flies off. Uh, don't feed it and don't give it water when it's um, dazed and confused. It's not gonna work and it's probably gonna kill it. <laughs> and But just keep seeing if it'll uh, fly free. If it's got an obvious injury where it's actually sprained or broken a wing, uh, then it needs to go to a rehabber. Any other questions? I, I guess it's time for you to have dinner. <laughs> yeah, I could never eat before these things. <laughs> and then I'm usually too, um, you know, I'm an introvert. This is, you know, a little bit above my. <laughs> is there, I have a question. Uh huh. Is there any way to discourage crows from nesting in, you know, near my yard? Or we have so many crows and you know, we have lots of birds because we are native gardeners and have spruce and um, other tall evergreens. That's exactly the kind of trees they nest in too. But they are fairly territorial. You probably only have a single nesting pair there. Uh, young crows help their parents um, 
the next year, especially young males, uh, sometimes uh, they'll have three or four babies of their own from earlier years who are helping them uh, raise their, their little babies. Um, but um, I don't know of a good way. Tragically, in my approach to crows is to whistle and put peanuts in my feeders and then they come far and wide because they hear the lady with the peanuts. So I'm not the right one to ask about that. I figure a bird that's smarter than me kind of belongs here as much as I do. <laughs> Thank you. Even birds that are stupider, though, there aren't that many of those. <laughs> yeah. Bad girl. Stop bad mouthing yourself. <laughs> it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. <laughs> As always, an excellent presentation. I can't yeah. write fast enough. <laughs> well, presumably we will get a recording of this at some point. My son was really quick with the owl one last time. So. Mm -hmm. When is your next one, Laura? Uh, they're always on the first of the month, so it will be April Fool's Day, but I'll actually show up. <laughs> Laura, there's a question in the chat about how to get a bird out of a garage. Oh, that is such a nightmare. Um, uh, w when it's like panicking or when it is like nesting there. Because barn swallows and house sparrows and some other birds will actually nest in people's garages. But if a bird flies in, uh, even a hummingbird and hummingbirds are attracted to the pull on garage doors. And that there's those, I think there's actually some sort of um, uh, zoning rules or what are the, the rules for safety OSHA rules that make them be red and hummingbirds will get, will fly to check out that red and then um, they, they end up in the garage and when birds are scared, they go up and that means they're going to the garage roof, not to the garage door. You want to keep the garage door wide open and you want to either open windows in the garage or cover them up so the bird doesn't see them. Um, but it can be um, kind of a nightmare trying to get them out. And uh, I don't think there's any bird stupider as far as not being able to handle things than robins and grackles. When they get confused, those poor things just dig themselves in deeper. They, um, they never heard that thing that Einstein supposedly said about insanity is trying the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. But if, if it's a hummingbird putting a feeder down, but uh, I always tell people if they do get hummingbirds in their garage to use some sort of electrical tape over the red on the garage door pole because it just is saying, hey, hummingbird, come on in. And then they make it like the Roach Motel where they check in and they don't know how to check out again. <laughs> and so I guess um, next time we'll be learning about my ill-fated PhD program and Nighthawks and um, lots of cool Blue Jay stories and, um, and some other cool stuff, Sora, owls, Pileated and woodpeckers and flickers, though I've talked about those kind of a lot, so you know most of it already if you've been to any of these. Well, this I'm was wonderful. Say. This was wonderful, Laura. I was going just getting ready to ask you about what training you had to be a rehabber, and you answered the questions. So 
Yeah, it was very depressing that someone could have so little training. You know, you're and and, and the funny thing is, the more well-meaning you are, um, the the worse it feels to screw up. But all the good intentions in the world don't help if you don't know what birds need in terms of food, in terms of their behaviors. Next time is when I'm going to be talking about how they get locked into certain behaviors, depending on what species they are. And you have to intuitively figure out how to give them what they need. Uh, uh, some rehabbers uh, who do a great job of keeping them alive through release don't give baby birds enough of a backup system while they're becoming wild. Um, you have to do it the way you do peregrine falcons. You have to hack them out, giving them a way of coming back and getting help if they need it. But that is tricky. And hmm. it's all tricky, but we do our best and we keep learning. And that's right. Is supposedly why our species is the only one with rocket scientists. <laughs> well, thank you very much for some great stories. I mean, some of these I've heard over the years, but it's lovely to hear them again. Yes. I always think what an interesting experience for your children to grow up in that environment, taking care of the baby birds. And the story you told about Katie at, at school saying it was an American robin. Yeah, that kids. was like, a, yeah, she was, a, when she was in kindergarten, they had a phonics sheet. They were supposed to write the starting letter for all these little pictures. And there was a bird and they were all supposed to write a B, but the teacher knew it was a robin and that some of the kids might write an R and that would be right. But Katie had written an A. And she got all the other ones right. So she said, what do you think that was, Katie? And she said, that's an American robin. <laughs> and her teacher said, she just said it like the sky is blue. You know, like everybody <laughs> should know that. <laughs> yeah, I'm worried about my poor little Walter. <laughs> Whether he'll be. Uh, somebody asked about pet birds and what a good choice is if you're going to get a bird uh, to live as a companion at home. And um, I'm, I really uh, think the best two choices if you want the bird to interact with you would be a baby cockatiel or a, or a baby parakeet, though that one sounded like it was a bad choice. Uh, you should get it when it's, uh, you should get one from a breeder who hand raises the baby. So it will imprint on you if you want it to be your companion. But if you do, you have to also ha take the responsibility to really be a companion for the bird as much as you want it to be for you. And that means you have to let it know other people so you have a backup when you go anywhere. My sister-in-law has a cockatoo of some kind. I can't remember which kind, but the bird is 35 years old now. I mean, you get, you get some of those, those kinds of birds, you gotta include them in your will. Who's going to inherit the bird? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Laura? Yeah. Um, I just wanna add a trick. This is Mark down in Southwest Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, on the birds in the garage. I've had a lot of success when the birds get in the garage and then they're banging themselves against the windows to try to get out. I open up all the garage doors, then I leave the garage and I go to the windows where the bird oh. is trying to get And then I, it sees me in the window, it gets scared, it does a 180 and it flies out the garage door every time. That mm -hmm. is smart. I'm going to remember that. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> 
we're all we're all smarter together <laughs> that's what it is you know it takes a village and um i have some you know really wonderful experiences in my life but I have them all because people gave them to me by giving me the knowledge. Thank you, Bob Hinkle. And uh, just so many, uh, the inspiration, uh, being able to call Marge Gibson whenever. And, you know, she had a, you know, a busy, busy life, but she would take time out when I needed her. So it takes a village. And that's what we're here for. I'll, I'll echo the other comments. Thanks very much for a very interesting evening. Thanks for coming. Yeah, we didn't break 100 this time. I guess you have to be owls to get 100 people at a talk. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll pretend the next one's going to be about owls or some <laughs> other uh, charismatic species, and uh, then we'll just say, April Fools. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night, dear lady. Take good care. Good night, everybody. Thank you Bye. all for coming. Thank you. Good night, Laura. Good night, everyone.